Uh, we're delighted to have with us His Excellency Asad Umar, uh, Pakistan's Federal Minister for Planning, Development, Reform, and Special Initiatives. He'll be discussing the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. This is the Pakistan component of China's Belt and Road Initiative. It is also one of the most operationalized components of the BRI. Since uh, being launched in 2015, uh, the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, has produced a series of new infrastructure projects in Pakistan, many of them focused on energy. Last month, Minister Umar stated that CPEC is moving into a second phase, which will focus more on accelerated industrial cooperation with China. It's a delight to be here with, uh, with His Excellency Assad Omar uh, and his delegation, and the Ambassador of Pakistan has joined us as well. Um, and to talk about CPEC in particular, and I know you're about to make a presentation for us on that, um, it does remind me of when I first went to Pakistan uh, as ambassador, uh, I checked with my chain of command at the State Department about what position we should be taking on CPEC. And this, of course, was during the Obama administration. And I was told, and I was happy to hear, that we should be supportive of it. Um, it's a decision for Pakistan and China, and if it helps develop uh, Pakistan's potential, uh, then that will be a stabilizing element, and that would be favorable to United States interests. Next. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you look at CPEC, what has it been delivering to Pakistan so far? Uh, the single biggest set of investments went into uh, power generation. Pakistan had a significant power generation uh, deficit, and that power generation deficit is now uh, largely been addressed by capacity set up under CPEC. So if you look at transport infrastructure, that was the second big leg of the uh, of uh, CPEC in the first phase. 1,800 kilometers of new motorways, highways, and urban mass transit projects were executed and have been completed. And uh, 820 kilometer of optic fiber cable was laid. An international airport at Gwadar is under construction at this point in time. Gwadar is the main port. Uh, which is the endpoint for CPEC connectivity. And I'll, okay, uh, what is happening in CPEC 2.0, as I call it, or Phase Two, uh, industrial cooperation. Uh, four SEZs uh, in Gwadar Free Zone being developed on priority. Uh, two of them operational right now. Actually, the third one has also become operational. And the point to emphasize here is this is not China specific. Any these SEZs which are being used for CPEC uh, uh, countries. Uh, any country in the world can have investments coming in, and we already have examples of a German, UK, Dutch uh, companies coming and in investing, along with Chinese and, of course, Pakistani companies investing in these industrial zones. So this is the industrial leg of this cooperation is just kicking off, and we believe that it's going to accelerate from this point onwards. And because one of the um, key reasons why we saw uh, a reluctance of Western investment to come in was the security situation in the country. As you know, post 9-11, once Pakistan uh, went and uh, took on these, uh, uh, the extremist groups which are operating at the fringes or across the border, uh, there was a tremendous blowback in Pakistan. It created a very, very serious security environment. More than 80,000 people lost their lives, and, uh, and, and there was a point in time where uh, some kind of a terrorist attack was a, a routine affair. Things have become significantly better than since then. Uh, the Pakistani security uh, forces have carried out a phenomenal job, uh, took on a lot of uh, loss of lives themselves, but they have been able to, uh, to curtail the terrorist activities in the country. And normalcy has returned, and investment and economic activity has returned. Uh, there are some interesting anomalies, I, should, uh, I shouldn't call it an anomaly that sounds like something bad, uh, but a, a country which stands out, Netherlands, I, I don't know if you noticed that, uh, but significant investment has been coming from ne Netherlands in the last few years, so it's not all um, Western countries. But yes, the U.S. Uh, investment into, into the country or the U.K. investment into the country is not what it used to be. And we are hoping with the economic opportunities, after all, is uh, the fifth largest country in the world. There are 225 million consumers out there. And as uh, Pepsi and Coke and Procter and & Gamble can tell you, uh, it's, it's a market worth being in. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Hamad Alam from Dunya News has asked, um, it's said that China is developing Pakistan's hardware, its roads, its dams, its energy, its projects, and so forth. Can you tell us what the Pakistani government is doing to develop Pakistan's software? Uh, by that, the rule of law 
education, human development, and governance? Okay. First of all, uh, China, along with uh, many other countries, does invest in the country's uh, infrastructure development. Uh, but I think it would be fair to say the Pakistani are developing Pakistan's infrastructure with support from uh, from countries around the world, as is the case for, for any country in the world. Even in the United States of America, there are foreign investors who come and invest in infrastructure projects. Uh, in terms of software, it's an important question, and uh, long-term success, in, in our opinion, will be dependent on that. Uh, there have been uh, very significant initiatives taken. Uh, healthcare is absolutely vital. And uh, I'm happy to say that we are uh, on the verge, which is months away from achieving something which many developed countries do not have, which is a universal health insurance program. Every single Pakistani is getting covered in there. Most of Pakistan is already covered in the health insurance program which has been launched. Uh, higher education investments in the last uh, three years, we have increased investments in higher education by two and a half fold. Uh, there is a lot more that needs to be done. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And this is an area which continues to be of focus and priority. And a uh, lot of work going on, but a lot more work that needs to be done. Thank you. Um, Dilawar Bajuri of the World Bank Group has asked, will the SEZs, the Special Economic Zones, um, across CPEC hire locally, hire Pakistanis? and provide employment to the local Pakistani population? And what are, what's the status of investments uh, coming into the SEZs? So the answer is, the uh, straightforward answer is yes. Uh, the initial projects were infrastructure projects. Infrastructure projects, by definition, are not very uh, labor-intensive in nature. Uh, there were uh, Chinese engineers and technical people who came in. There were a lot of locals also which were employed. But the the CPEC 2.0, as I call it, which is industry, agriculture, that's labor intensive. And the overwhelming manpower for that is uh, Pakistani uh, manpower. I was uh, at a uh, textile site near Lahore, uh, a Chinese-owned company. Uh, in that shift while I was there, there were 2,800 uh, workers uh, on the site, uh, all Pakistani. There was one Chinese only at the site. So overwhelmingly, uh, the jobs uh, which are going to be created both in industry as well as agriculture and information technology will be Pakistani uh, jobs. That's very encouraging. Um, a somewhat related question from Rafiq Dosani of the RAND Corporation, who asks, how has CPEC affected the development of industry in Pakistan? Uh, how have the tourism and textile industries benefited? And is there evidence of improved economic integration with the supply chains of China? And if so, which industries have uh, seen that benefit? Yeah, so, so that work is, is just started. As I said, the industrial uh, uh, cooperation part of the uh, CPEC has just been operationalized in the last year or so. Uh, so we are at the initial stages right now. Textile already gave you examples. Uh, Chinese companies have already, and that's the uh, value-added end of the textile chain, so the garments, et cetera. And, uh, and these, these, are being, uh, these are producing goods for mainly the Western markets. Uh, Adidas was one of the brands that, that I saw being uh, put together there. Uh, on tourism, uh, not much has happened yet in terms of the Chinese uh, uh, engagement. However, the tourism industry in Pakistan, especially in the north, is just booming. I, I, I was in Gilgit, Baltistan. I don't know Ms. whether Mr. Dusani has visited that place or not. Uh, just last weekend. And, and I was told that in that uh, area, the previous year, the total number of rooms available were about 2,000. And this year, that's gone up to between nine and 10,000. So almost five-fold increase in the rooms available in just one year. Uh, there's a massive, primarily domestic tourism boom. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Anybody who's listening out there, who's in the hospitality industry, uh, it's the most breath breathtakingly spectacular uh, place on earth. I've lived in North America, I've been to Switzerland, I've been to most of the beautiful sites in the world. Trust me, there is nothing like this. So there's a tremendous opportunity to make tons of money if people go in early right now. That's great to hear. And what about the supply chains? There's a follow-on question about the supply chain linkages with China. So, that, so that's what we have started to work on right now, both in the information technology domain as well as the industrial domain. The, uh, China is... Uh, 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 our, frankly, the bigger opportunity is not producing goods to go into the Chinese market. It's by becoming embedded in the uh, value chain of Chinese uh, products meant for the global market, including uh, China. 
And uh, there are parts of the value chain where Pakistan can be extremely competitive. Like the example of the garments that I talked about, uh, the fabric comes in from China, and then the garment uh, manufacturing takes place in Pakistan. Uh, there is mobile phone assembly now starting to take place in Pakistan. In fact, it's been a fairly dramatic buildup, uh, and uh, we've already just uh, reached a point where domestically uh, assembled phones are now the bigger part of the market and the imports are now the minority. Samsung has just an, uh, announced that they're coming into Pakistan for mobile phones. So there are a number of these industries where it's uh, starting to happen. We also uh, believe that on, in the uh, knowledge economy, uh, there will be an opportunity for Pakistani companies to become part of the Chinese uh, value chain. Pakistani, there are a number of Pakistanis companies which are already a part of the value chain of U.S. Uh, infotech companies, and we believe a similar opportunity exists for the Chinese companies. Um, now, you mentioned that, uh, or you were quoted recently, saying that Pakistan and China have welcomed other countries to join CPEC, and uh, as you and your presentation outlined, the, the concept of a regional corridor. <clears throat> Can you elaborate a bit on what specific countries have been interested and um, and what you think they can contribute to this whole enterprise? Yeah, so uh, as I showed in the presentation examples of, uh, there are companies which are starting to come in, uh, Western companies, uh, Germany, uh, Netherlands, ExxonMobil is actually one of the biggest chemical companies in the world, uh, UK company coming in. So there are investors starting to come in. It's, uh, what is CPEC doing? CPEC is uh, doing two things for the investor in general. One, it is improving the quality of the infrastructure available. And second, by focusing attention, it is improving the uh, service delivery to these investors. So providing them an opportunity to work in special economic zones where infrastructure needs are met, where decision making is quick, where uh, the ease of doing business that you referred to is taken care of. And that's of interest to any investor. And, and we are starting to see the, uh, the result of that. Um, uh, there is, in specific terms, we are not kind of singled out any particular country or group of countries and said, you please come and participate in these projects. That's an invitation for the world, and, and we would welcome uh, investment coming in from any country uh, in these uh, special economic zones or as a part of this overall corridor. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I think we're waiting for some more questions from the audience, so uh, do feel free to... Um, we talked already about uh, foreign direct investment and uh, the United States uh, trade relationship with Pakistan. In my experience, uh, you know, countries like Pakistan do need to market themselves. Um, there's limited capital, and uh, many questions are that uh, American investors have may be based on uh, past assumptions that may no longer be valid, uh, but a little education is needed. Uh, I'm sure your visit here is part of that. Can you elaborate on strategies that you may have to, uh, to tell Pakistan's story? That's a very good question, and that's something that Pakistan perhaps has not done very well. Uh, as you said, uh, the situation has evolved. Uh, you were in Pakistan for three years. You, you saw that improvement. Uh, but not everybody around the world has heard that, and I think we need to do a better job of reaching out. And that's something that the Prime Minister has been emphasizing also. Uh, you, you might have seen... Uh, there is a greater emphasis, and suddenly a lot of people from the federal cabinet in Pakistan are turning up in, 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 uh, in the U.S., and that's starting to happen uh, with other uh, Western capitals also. Uh, we need to get the word out. It is uh, definitely a much safer place. It's always been a place of great opportunity. You know, before uh, I came into politics, I used to be in the corporate sector, and, uh, and my biggest problem used to be which uh, opportunity do I say yes to? There's so many opportunities. Uh, so, so the country is full of opportunities. People are welcoming. You would have, uh, you would have experienced that. Uh, very hospitable people, great economic opportunity. We need to get the word out, and, uh, and there are many areas, as I said. Uh, 225 million people is a lot of consumers. So there's, there, there's, the, there's absolutely no doubt about the opportunity being uh, available. And uh, some very high skill levels and uh, English language competencies as well as a uh, place to do business. Um, someone uh, has written in anonymously, um, how can Pakistan ensure continuity in CPEC uh, in terms of the, the government? If, for example, Imran Khan were no longer prime minister after the 2023 election, how do you sustain all of this? So uh, there is a national consensus on CPEC. In fact, if you, uh, you would have witnessed this during your time in Pakistan, uh, the criticism of CPEC 
used to be not largely, there were some uh, discordant voices, but largely the criticism of CPEC was not why is CPEC being done, but it were the provinces saying, why am I not getting a bigger share of CPEC, uh, particularly the smaller provinces. So, so CPEC is seen as something which is good. It is something which people demand more of. Uh, so in terms of uh, political debate, there is uh, no debate on whether we should encourage CPEC or not. Uh, there is, uh, uh, all, there is a, a very strong feeling, which also cuts across political parties, uh, that it must not be seen as a bilateral thing to the exclusion of others. And, and hence the emphasis and, and, uh, and the great desire uh, to have other countries also come and participate in these industrial zones or these ventures uh, because uh, uh, it, it is not meant to be and, uh, and it is not in our interest for it to be seen as uh, being done in exclusion of, uh, of uh, other uh, engagements and other relationships.